Hello, welcome. I am Michael Hussey, Interim Dean at Widener Law Commonwealth. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 14th annual John Gettet Lecture, named after the founder of our Law and Government Institute, Emeritus Professor John Gettet. Our Law and Government Institute helps students explore how government works and the roles that lawyers play in making and implementing the law. As a result, our students develop a passion for government law, which in turn leads to Widener Law Commonwealth alumni working in all areas of government law and public service. Our alumni are key to ensuring that the rule of law is rightly developed and fairly implemented. I hope you find today's lecture engaging and thought provoking. It is now my pleasure to introduce Commonwealth Professor of Law and Government, Jill Family. Professor Family joined the law school in 2005 and has directed the Institute since 2013, continuing and expanding upon the great work done by Emeritus Professor Gettet. As Interim Dean, I am grateful to Professor Family for her leadership of the Institute. Professor Family? Thank you so much, Dean Hussey. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, despite the virtual nature of the program, we are so glad that we are able to bring our wonderful program to you this afternoon. And I want to thank all of our generous donors to the Long Government Institute, many of whom are participating on this Zoom. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dean Hussey for his support of the Law and Government Institute, as well as my colleagues on the Widener faculty, um, as well as Brian Fernbaugh, who is our AV expert and without whom all of our Zooming would not be possible. I'd also like to recognize and thank uh, Joy Boudreau um, for all of her help um, making this event making online CLE possible for those of you who are seeking Pennsylvania um, CLE as well. Um, one last recognition I'd like to point out our Long Government Institute Patrick J. Murphy Fellows, Katie Paradise and Sean Peterson. These are two fabulous Widener Law Commonwealth students who through a competitive process were selected for a fellowship that allows them to help me run the Long Government Institute, as well as pursue their interests in government law. This is our 14th annual Get It Lecture. This one was originally scheduled for the spring, but rescheduled for today due to uh, the pandemic. As Dean Hussey said, this lecture series honors John Gettet, who is one of the founders of our law school and the founder of the Law and Government Institute. And these lectures celebrate public service as well as John Gettin's enthusiasm and support for our law school and legal scholarship, especially in the area of administrative law. Um, if I could just ask Brian to highlight John, he is here on Zoom, but there he is. Hi, John, I see his wonderful Hello. Carol in the back as well, who's always been a big supporter of the Institute. Hi, Carol. So we're glad at least for everyone to be able to get a look at you and um, we can thank you again as we like doing every year for all of your support for the Institute and your efforts in creating it in the first place. Um, so as Professor Hussey mentioned, the Long Government Institute holds a unique and special place at Widener Law Commonwealth. And perhaps most importantly, the Institute's mission is founded on the idea that government works, that government is a positive force in our society. And as Professor Hussey mentioned, um, we train lawyers to be a part of that positive force. Um, just a couple of announcements before I introduce our speaker. One is we will have time for questions and answers at the end of uh, Professor Stack's presentation. If you use the raise hand feature on Zoom, since we have, um, fabulous to see so many of you, but since we have so many people together, it would be easiest if you could use the raise hand feature on Zoom. And at that point, we will unmute you to ask your question when it's your turn to ask your um, question. 
And one other quick announcement, and that has to do with those of you who are seeking Pennsylvania CLE, um, a link with the CLE credit form um, will be made available in the chat and will also be emailed to every attendee along with a certificate of attendance following the program. And this online form must be filled out and submitted in order to be eligible for Pennsylvania CLE credit. So either you'll see a link to the form in the chat or you should receive one after the program. And now um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, um, Professor Kevin Stack. Professor Stack is the Lee S. and Charles A. Spear Professor of Law at Vanderbilt University Law School. He writes and teaches in the areas of administrative law, separation of powers, and statutory interpretation. In 2019, he was appointed as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States, um, otherwise known by its short name of ACUS. ACUS is a federal agency that works to improve administrative law. In 2013, he received the American Bar Association's Annual Scholarship Award for the best published work in administrative law. He is the co-author of The Regulatory State, a casebook on statutes and administrative lawmaking. He served as a law clerk in the Southern District of New York and in the Ninth Circuit. His law degree is from Yale. He holds a master's degree in philosophy from Oxford University and a bachelor's degree from Brown University. Mm. I had the opportunity to get to know Kevin when we served together as council members of the ABA's administrative law section. Kevin is not only an impressive teacher and scholar, but he is also a wonderful person and colleague. It was my absolute pleasure to work with him and to continue to exchange ideas about administrative law. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kevin Stack. Thank you so much, Jill, for that warm uh, and nice introduction I, uh, and for putting this event together. I'm really delighted uh, to be here today and I'm delighted to be, uh, have a chance to celebrate the conversation about law and government that John Geddon uh, got initiated at uh, Widener in the Commonwealth in the Institute of Law and Government and to honor his commitment to administrative law and to public service. So uh, I'm sorry we couldn't, I couldn't be there uh, in Harrisburg to share a drink, uh, but I'm very much looking forward to our conversation today. So in the past 40 years, we've seen uh, presence assert greater centralized control over the federal administrative bureaucracy as a means of implementing their own policies. Justice Kagan's term presidential administration has become a convenient shorthand for this development and ongoing conversation. In my lecture today, I wanna to argue that we're seeing the rise or perhaps the resurgence of a new model of the relationship between the president and the federal bureaucracy, which I call partisan administration. In it, the president uses the federal bureaucracy, not merely for advancing policy, but also for the purpose of uh, benefiting his own party in electoral terms. So my strategy for uh, defending this kind of claim is I first want to motivate uh, the rise of presidential administration and describe some of the tools that presidents have relied on as part of this uh, presidential administration. Then I want to turn and give a fuller account of what I mean by partisan administration. And I'll look to some work in political science on the ways in which uh, presidents have used spending and grant authority to reward particular states for electoral or partisan purposes. Then I'm gonna to turn to a couple of examples of, uh, from President Trump's administration, which I believe fit the model of partisan administration. And I'm gonna try and identify what I think are the distinctive tools of partisan administration and contrast them with the tools of presidential administration. Having gotten through that sort of descriptive work, then I wanna set out what I think is the wrong of partisan administration. My guess is that many of us uh, uh, have pretty strong intuitions about what's wrong with using government to elect fellow partisans. But I think it's worth articulating what are the fundamental and underlying legal foundations for those intuitions. And I'm gonna argue that partisan administration violates um, a categorical constitutional principle located in the First Amendment, which prohibits government from taking sides, from tipping the electoral scales in favor of one party or another. 
And I'm going to end on a brief note of optimism about pathways of renewal. So that's sort of where I'm going. So, so let me, uh, actually, I forgot to, I got excited and just jumped off the mark there. I want to, I need to, I have a couple slides and I want to share screen here and get those going. Uh, this I want to do slideshow. Uh, so uh, perhaps one thing that we're not polarized about as a nation is that we're probably tired of being called polarized. So I'm going to be very brief on this slide, but I think it's still uh, an important launching point for what I'm about to say. So this is a well-known chart uh, produced by the Pew uh, Research Center, and I think it pretty efficiently illustrates our, our political polarization. It measures the approval rate of presidents by party. It shows a widening gap. Right. Individuals from both parties are less and less likely to approve of the performance of the president from an opposite party. So whereas uh, Eisenhower had a 49% approval rate among Democrats, uh, President Obama had a 14% approval rate among Republicans, and so on. And so, uh, so, so now let's see if we can turn, what, so what's the impact of that approval rate on our institution? So let's just turn first briefly to Congress. So uh, I th our polarization has uh, many effects on Congress, and I want to highlight two of them. So the first, it affects how members of Congress vote. So this is a graph from a recent book called The Limits of Party by uh, uh, James Curry and Francis Lee. And the graph shows the percentage of roll call votes, where at least 90% of Republicans voted against 90% of Democrats. That's a very high, that's a higher bar than you usually used to judge party conflict and cohesion. And the results are pretty dramatic, which as we see in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, less than 10% of the votes in the House and the Senate showed this level of party conflict. Today, over 50% of the votes in the House and close to 40% of the votes in the Senate show that level of party conflict and cohesion. Okay, so we see, uh, 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 so let me say then, so our, Polarization is not only affecting how members of Congress vote, but it also is affecting how they engage in the process of legislation, how Congress organizes its own work. Let me just give one example of this. So um, party leaders now have a more central role in the legislative process than they used to, and they frequently bypass what we think of as the conventional legislative process where legislation originates in committees. And so this uh, graph shows that in the 70s and 80s, close to 100% uh, of legislation was produced with a committee report. And it shows the gradual decline. So now uh, close to, uh, you know, 60% uh, you know, of the uh, cases, roughly 60 to 70% are, um, uh, don't, uh, are produced with the committee. So there's a huge drop off there, which I think shows the importance of party leadership. So quickly, polarization then has had effect on how Congress votes and how it legislates. legislates. So now uh, I want to turn the focus uh, to think about the executive branch. Uh, how has polarization had an impact on the president and the executive branch? Uh, and um, uh, certainly making legislation in our system is never easy, even in a period of unified government. Uh, but we've been living in a period uh, where uh, divided government has been more common than unified government. Uh, routinely, as now, the president lacks a majority in the House or in the Senate. As a result, the conventional story goes, presidents have had more and more difficulty enacting their domestic and foreign agendas uh, through legislation and have increasingly sought to implement their national policy through the executive branch alone, thus the rise of presidential administration. Beginning with President Nixon or President Reagan, depending on who you're reading and when, uh, presidents have devoted increasing energy to controlling the content of and timing of agency regulations, agency spending, agency enforcement priorities, and even agency guidance. Presidents, to, just to give a couple of examples of presidential administration, President Obama's programs created for creating deferred action uh, for uh, immigrants, DACA and DAPA, uh, both set in motion nationwide policies 
that he hoped would eventually be written into legislation, uh, having previously faced gridlock in Congress. Uh, so too, President Trump's systematic rollback of environmental regulations shows the force of presidential administration. So it's worth emphasizing the chief goal of presidential administration, at least from the president's perspective, is to have the president be able to efficiently implement national policy through the executive branch. And that goal helps to explain the primary tools of presidential administration as we've come to appreciate them. So if you wanna control national policy, you need, to, you need some control over regulations, when they're issued and what they say. And so presidents have created centralized regulatory review mechanisms, uh, including the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which can overrule, slow down, adjust, revise agency regulations. And if you wanna control how aggressive agencies are in enforcement and in their spending, it's also useful to have centralized monitoring mechanism and OIRA and OMB perform some of those functions as well. And you know, it's good to create oversight at the agency level as well. It helps to have officials uh, subject to presidential appointments uh, who are more loyal to you. And we've seen upward trends in presidential appointments and their more partisan nature. And when all those mechanisms for trying to crawl the bureaucracy don't work, uh, the president still has directive authority and can issue uh, 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 memorandum and executive orders to try to implement his will. So if the goal is implementing a, a, a policy on a national scale through the executive branch, the tools of centralized review, loyal personnel, directive powers, control over disclosure, those are all critical. And, and the legal academy, we've had a long running debate about the legality, the dynamics and the normative implications of those developments. So now let me turn to the, the idea of partisan administration. So what I mean by partisan administration is taking administrative action or executive action using the resources or personnel of the executive branch with the primary aim of benefiting the electoral prospects of the incumbent's political party or injuring the electoral prospects of uh, his or her opponents. So to capture the sense of partisanship I'm after, I think it's use, useful to refer to the context of congressional redistricting. So that's a rough and tumble context. And we know that majorities in state legislatures draw redistricting maps with the primary aim of securing as many seats as possible for uh, their own parties. So let me just give one example of that. So in the 2016 re redistricting in uh, the state of North Carolina, which I feel like I can pick on because I grew up in North Carolina, one of the chairs of the redistricting commission uh, 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 commented that they drew a map with the aim of electing 10 Republicans and three Democrats because they didn't think it would be possible to draw a map that elected 11 Republicans and two Democrats. So partisanship here is raw, crude, tribal right, in the sense of trying to enhance one's own electoral prospects without regard to policy considerations. So whereas presidential administration seeks to control national policy and implement it through the executive branch, this is the, the goal of partisan administration is to make a difference in the likelihood of one's own party getting reelected. And that goal, I think, makes a difference in the tools presidents rely on for the purpose of partisan administration. The way I'm thinking about it now, there's uh, three categories of tools or three pathways. So the first is presidents can engage in pork barrel politics. We think of pork barrel politics as the domain of legislatures, you know, send money back for projects back home, home districts and home states. Uh, but like legislatures, presidents have some control and ability to target funding and grants to particular geographic region, region, regions and to do so at particular times. And they can reward and punish based on those ideas. So that's one pathway of presidential politics, which I'll turn to in a minute. You identify the other two pathways. Uh, the presidents can also attempt to alter the machinery of elections, right? From who votes to how they vote, how those votes are counted, right? And how districts are apportioned. So while elections are conducted at the state level, uh, there are still managerial decisions at the federal level uh, from how the Postal Service sorts mail, to how the census is conducted, to how to enforce the National Voter Registration Act at DOJ, which all involve the machinery of elections. So 
there's, there's some influence over the machinery of elections. And third, and kind of most obviously, administration can use government property and government resources for campaign pur purposes. And we, we've had some examples of that too. So now we turn to uh, the idea of uh, presidential pork barrel politics. And here's a, this is a quote, it's, pretty, it's a pretty snappy one uh, from uh, Richard Nixon, where uh, he is telling his chief uh, domestic advisor that in your budget plans, I want Missouri and the other states listed here to get less than they have in the past. And the message should be clear that states with Republican senators are gonna do better and uh, those with uh, Democratic senators are, are not gonna do as well. And at the time, the states he listed that he wanted to punish, you know, 11 of the 12 senators were, from, were Democrats. Uh, so uh, let me now, so, and, and over the last uh, decade, political scientists uh, studying distributive politics um, have made a, a strong statistical case that presidents do engage in pork barrel politics. So I want to highlight a pretty high level uh, summary, some of the results of, uh, 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 of those studies. So number one, uh, districts with representatives of the same party as the president win, right? Uh, if your representative is the same party as the president, you do better. So this is a study that covered from 1987 to 2007, tracking $24 trillion of expenditure by Barry and co-authors. And they found that federal spending was four to 5% higher in congressional districts that match the president's political party. So second, kind of right along with that, and along with Nixon's quote here, uh, states with senators of the same party the president also get more grants. So this is a study of grants between 1984 and 2008. Uh, Dino Christensen and co-authors found that having one senator as a party of the president increased grant funding by about a point and a half, and having two senators increased uh, funding by nearly three points. So third, uh, this is a little bit of a combo one, uh, states that uh, electorally supported the president, as well as states with a governor of the same party of the president, also win on federal grant funding. And then finally, fourth, there's uh, uh, indications that timing matters. So John Hudak in his book, uh, Presidential Pork, uh, shows that swing states receive 6% more grant funding, right, uh, when, an, a federal, when an election is approaching and when it's distant. So I think these studies show that the president is exerting some control over how non-mandatory budget appropriations are being allocated, uh, and he's able to reprogram uh, some funds and use contingency funds uh, to his benefit. I think they break up a little bit the myth of a kind of totally nationalist uh, president. They see the president looking at particular constituencies and trying to, to, uh, to benefit. I think the strength of these studies is their controlled statistical analysis. They're a little weaker on isolating the exact uh, mechanisms, the places in the bureaucracy where these, where these happen. Okay. And so with that thought, let me turn to the Trump, to the Trump administration. So if pork barrel politics was the primary tool of, pri uh, of presidential, uh, I'm sorry, of partisan administration, uh, or at least the most well-documented one prior to the Trump administration. Under the Trump administration, the machinery of elections has been the focus, right? He has also used the imprimatur of government to campaign, but the machinery of elections has been the focus. I wanna highlight uh, three different sets of examples, which I think uh, illustrate the president acting in this way, which fits the model of partisan administration. Um, so uh, the, uh, the first, the first, which is really two, two points, uh, uh, and I'll take a little longer with on, on the census. So our census coincided with President Trump's term in office. And in March 2018, the Secretary of Commerce, uh, Wilbur Ross, uh, announced that he wanted to reinstate a question asking, about, asking respondents about their citizenship on the census. And his stated justification was that asking this question would uh, improve enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. And he said uh, in, in, at the same time that he couldn't definitely determine whether asking this question would suppress uh, the response rate or response rate among particular populations. Well, that justification did not fail farewell in court. Uh, in uh, June of 2019, the Supreme Court agreed with the district court in New York uh, that the secretary's justification was pretextual and contrived, that is false, 
uh, the Secretary of the Supreme Court suggested wanted to include the citizenship question, and this justification was just manufactured cover. While it's difficult to prove motive, um, a finding that the Secretary's publicly stated motive, the one he chose and picked, was pretextual and contrived, is a pretty good indicator of another darker motive. And in this case, I think one would be naive not to recognize that including a citizenship question will depress a response rates to the census, particularly among Hispanics. And the census that undercounts Hispanics improves the prospects of election for the Republican incumbents by overpopulating districts uh, represented by Democrats and even possibly reducing the number of seats for some states that are overwhelmingly uh, Democratic seats in, in the House. Okay. The second example coming out of the census is in uh, July 2020, uh, President Trump uh, issued a memo declaring that for the purpose of reapportionment of the House following the census, it's the quote, policy of the United States to exclude from apportionment base aliens who are not in a lawful immigration status. So the memo directs the uh, uh, Secretary of Commerce to report two different numbers uh, for each state, the total population, um, as well as the total population minus those who don't have legal immigration status. Well, earlier this month, uh, on September 10th, 2020, um, a three judge district court in the Southern District of New York held this memo was unlawful because it violates a statutory prohibition that only the total population be reported for the purposes of apportionment. The clarity of this statutory command, combined with the prior effort to include a citizenship question, raises, I think, a very serious question about the motivation for the memo. One thing is clear, if the memo were to be valid and uh, apportionment were to be done based on the lower population number, it would have clear partisan consequences. It would distort uh, apportionment in states, and it would possibly reallocate uh, uh, the places, apportion states um, from some states to others. California, say, may lose two or three seats. So second, and let me move to a, a second and third set of examples here. These will be a little quicker. So uh, mail-in voting. So in August 2020, President Trump set off concerns about whether there would be delays in the postal service, in the postal service would impede uh, uh, the ability to do mail-in voting. Uh, at roughly the same time, it was revealed that the Postal Service was engaging in a, a, a bunch of very well publicized, at the time after they were revealed, uh, cost-cutting measures, including uh, uh, reducing, decommissioning many of its sorting machines, 13% of its machines, which was a bump from 3 and 5% in the previous years. Those cost-cutting measures fueled concern that concerns that Trump's new appointee to be Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, was intentionally creating slowdowns. Um, and after 21 states sued, the Postal Service uh, reversed course and largely halted these cost-cutting measures. So my sense is the most charitable interpretation of the Postal Service actions is there was ill-timed cost reduction. But given President Trump's repeated um, allegations that mail-in voting was riddled with fraud, as well as the historic reliance on mail-in voting during this election, it's hard to exclude the interpretation uh, that these dramatic cross-cutting measure, cross measures were intentional efforts to slow the mails before the election, or maybe just as likely to erode public confidence in mail-in voting. And that too has a clear partisan impact. Third example is, uh, I'll be most brief with, which is the uh, 2020 Republican National Conventions. In numerous ways, I think the 2020 Republican National Convention used the resources of government for campaign purposes. Most glaringly, uh, portions of the Republican National Convention were held at the White House. And it's hard to imagine a more clear use of the imprimatur and authority of government uh, than holding a campaign event uh, at the White House. You know, there was also a number of appearances from uh, secretaries. So Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, delivered a taped naturalization ceremony uh, at the convention, uh, seemed to blur his official role and the campaign purpose for which the, uh, the, the ceremony was taped. Secretary uh, of State Pompeo also made an, uh, a taped address from Jerusalem, also blurring uh, his, uh, his pol personal political views with the backdrop of his foreign service and the backdrop of Jerusalem in, in his talk. 
Uh, of course, there's, there are other allegations too. There are allegations of threats to cut, cut funding to California. There is a whistleblower complaint recently filed that alleges that uh, the official in the Department of Homeland Security was ordered to cease reporting on Russian interference with elections. And there's also kind of a background threat to involve the military some way in elections. So my claim though, is that all of these uh, 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 fit the bill of being partisan, mo partisan motivation of, uh, a, and use of a, the administrative bureaucracy. So now let me turn to, um, uh, let me turn to talk a little bit about what I view as uh, the wrong or uh, the wrong of partisan administration. And, and, and here's maybe one way into it, we could say there's two sides to the debate, to the normative debate about whether we're better or worse off and in what ways with presidential administration. There certainly are two sides and there's some respects in which we're, th th there's some coordination advantages and there's some other uh, respects in which it, it causes some real trouble. But there's definitely an ongoing and robust debate about the dynamics and the normative values. I would uh, think that most people would agree that pre uh, partisan administration really cuts one way, but it's still worth articulating why the, 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 the fundamental basis why, uh, why it's wrong. So uh, in, in my view, partisan administration defies a basic constitutional norm located in the First Amendment against go government partisanship. That norm is internalized in civil service protections for, for employment. It's internalized in statutory prohibitions like the Hatch Act on using official capacities for election purposes. And it's also reflected in campaign finance laws that prohibit using government resources uh, to fundraise. And because of all those statutory protections, we don't often see cases where Supreme Court gets to directly articulate this kind of harm, the harm of government partisanship. So I wanna to try to illustrate it in two different ways. So first, um, I, I think it's worth looking back at um, the um, partisan patronage cases. In this respect, I'm following uh, Michael K uh, Kang's lead uh, in exploring um, partisan redistricting cases. So in these patronage cases, um, uh, the uh, patronage practices, first of all, allowed the government to fire staff and replace them with party loyalists as a reward for their service. And the Supreme Court's held that a government cannot condition federal employment beyond or at least below the policy make, making level based on party affiliation. Such practices burden the freedom of political belief. And you can see it quite pragmatically. You think about yourself as being in a position of an employee who would lose his or her job, right? Uh, just because you didn't support uh, the newly elected mayor or uh, long ago the president, right? You face losing your job or having to change your political beliefs. So what patronage, uh, so what patronage does, this is in the words of Elwod versus Burns, is it tips the electoral balance in favor of the incumbent party. And this prohibition on tipping the scales in favor of the incumbent party is so critical that the First Amendment prohibition is categorical, right? Not a matter of degree, right? A small amount of patronage violates the, the First Amendment just as egregious patronage does. Okay, so that, that, there's a first set of thoughts. Second set of thoughts, and another way of thinking about this is to think about a, the government's commitment to non-endorsement. And here there's some, uh, I'm building on some work of Nelson Tebbe. Uh, so as Justice Scalia has observed, it would be unconstitutional for, quote, the government itself to promote candidates nominated by the Republican Party. Um, funding or promoting a political party, vote Democrat or vote Republican, right, involves viewpoint discrimination in the most egregious way. It tends to entrench the current political party, promoting that party's view and thereby imposing burdens on political opponents. Government promotion of a political party obstructs the pathways of political change. Uh, perhaps the most central goal of the First Amendment is protecting a political process that's open to change. So partisan administration is precisely an effort to use administration to tip the electoral scales in favor of the incumbent party. So the categorical wrong of partisan administration, in my view, is the wrong of distorting the process the, and distorting the possibility of political 
Okay. So I said I would end on an optimistic note, and I very much want to do so. So here's my, here's my ending, which is hopefully going to be on an optimistic note. So let's ask the question, well, can partisan administration be checked and limited without engaging in the more significant work required to reverse presidential administration, right? My inclination is to say yes, and that's partly a pragmatic yes, right? Because pushing back on all of presidential administration is a really big task, right? But I also think there's a, there's a justification for my yes as well, which is I think the tools of partisan administration are, are, are more easily limited and more isolated than the tools of presidential administration. Um, so if the, let's just go through each of the pathways I talk about. So if the problem is presidential pork spending at the margins, then the answer is greater constraint and transparency on the way in which OMB and resource officers work, and maybe the, some of the kind of transparency recommendations that Elise Pashkoff has, has uh, recommended. Um, if the problem is the president using the machinery of elections, I think this is a more difficult problem. It's a more difficult problem in part because the way in which presidents intervene is through managerial decisions. Uh, um, but the, 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 the positive side is these managerial decisions don't expand across all of government, right? They're, pertain they're located in a couple of more specified areas. And in those specified areas, hard air edge statutory constraints could be the cure. At least in my very small sample set, uh, they worked pretty well. Uh, think about the specificity of statutory law that required only reporting of total population as a constraint to President Trump's efforts to do otherwise. Okay, finally, if the problem is blurring the lines between government and campaigning, well, that can be addressed by enhancing uh, uh, cross-cutting prohibitions on the use of government for political health. That is, by enhancing uh, the protections provided by the Hatch Act. So the recently announced Protecting Our Democracy Act, drafted in the House, right, uh, augments the House, the, the, the Hatch Act's enforcement mechanisms. It seems like it's certainly a, a step in the right direction. So my optimistic ending is that the tools of partisan administration are more confined and more subject to good government reforms. And so we can tackle partisan administration without having to tackle all the tools of presidential administration. So thank you so much, and I really look forward uh, to any thoughts uh, or, or questions you have. I'll stop, stop sharing my screen here. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Stack. That was a very interesting talk, and I'm sure we have uh, participants who have lots of questions. Uh, before we start with the questions, I did want to highlight for everyone that we are recording this presentation, and we will be um, putting it up for public viewing after uh, we're finished. So if that at all influences the question you were going to ask, uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody realized we were recording. Um, so I'll go ahead, I'll take the prerogative of the first question and then we'll, we'll see what questions we have from our other attendees. So Kevin, my question is, how would you categorize between partisan administration and presidential administration, bureaucrat bureaucratic efforts to not implement laws that the current administration doesn't like. So I'm thinking of a particular example from immigration law, which is my area of expertise, where the current administration has really slowed down to the point of almost not functioning the legal immigration system, right? So not people who don't have permission to be here, but people who um, are applying for an immigration benefit. And through various bureaucratic efforts, the Trump administration has made it very difficult for people to obtain legal immigration status. Is that to you part of presidential administration or is that partisan administration? Yeah, um, thanks, Jill. It's, it's a great question. Um, and it goes to, a, a, well, I think is a, is, a, is a difficult point here, which is um, whenever you're talking about purpose, it's always hard to show purpose, especially if we're talking about a, a, a kind of a, a purpose to say engage in some kind of discrimination or, uh, or the kind of purpose I'm talking about, which is you know, discriminating on the basis of parties. So 
Uh, my answer would be that I think would be an example of presidential administration, which is the president is doing a lot of things uh, to implement policies that he believes uh, those uh, that support him uh, um, elected him to do. And that I think is an example of responsive politics. And some of it's, some of it's good, it can step over the line, but it responsive politics, uh, you know, even some I extreme measures could be responsive. So that seems like it's responsive politics generally. And I would say that's part, and then he's using the tools that could be done through legislation, but he's using the tools uh, of administrative action to implement that kind of responsive politics. Why I think it's not, uh, why it doesn't get to the level of what I'm, what I'm talking about is really pretty extreme behavior um, is um, it doesn't have, as far as I can tell, a direct electoral connection in the sense it's actually monkeying with the chances, directly, directly trying to skew the chances uh, of, of elections. So unless it was a case, for instance, that um, those who were, who were coming into the country could vote, right? Well, that would make a difference here. So, but I, 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 there's gonna be some continuum, of course, between uh, do, uh, promoting a national policy that is part of your political agenda that you hope is gonna score you political points in a general sense, and the sort of uh, uh, very narrowly focused uh, electoral uh, uh, eyes that I'm, I'm trying to talk about and characterize as partisan administration. Thank you. Okay, we'll open it up now. Uh, like I said, if you have a question, if you would use the raise hand feature, it looks like uh, Michael Hertz is our first buzzer inner. Maybe he should go on Jeopardy. Um, if Joy, if you could go ahead and unmute Michael Hertz. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, Hi, Kevin. Um, uh, I thought this was great and, and compelling and, and convincing. Uh, and I'm very sympathetic to the project. I, I had two sort of, if I had an objection, it was that, you know, this, that, that the kind of doctrinal constitutional analysis is a little bit Douglas and Griswold penumbras of emanations and so on. And so I wanted to get your reaction to two more kind of concrete doctrinal possible objections. Um, one is about the Hatch Act. So the Hatch Act, as I recall, specifically or at least is read to exempt the president and the vice president. It applies to every other presidential employee and not to the person you care about. And so to say, you know, these principles are embedded in the Hatch Act when the Hatch Act leaves the president alone, does that, A, does that bother you at all? B, does it reflect actually a different normative judgment about what's actually appropriate from the president? And on the First Amendment point, I, wonder, I feel there's a little tension between what you're saying and the, incre the court's increasing acceptance of the idea of government speech, that government can't regulate private speech, but it can take strong normative positions in its own speech. Um, and uh, um, and if you're saying, well, that's not true when it comes to like electoral politics, there's something slightly perverse there because what we used to think in a Michael Johnian sense was the core First Amendment protected speech, you're saying is the part that's actually not protected when we're talking about government speech. So th those are two, like I say, I'm basically with you, but though it seems to me those are two sort of specific doctrinal concerns that you have a little, your presentation was in a bit of tension with. Yeah, good. Uh, Michael, as always, thank you so much. It's great to see you, and thanks for uh, for uh, for tuning in here today. So uh, on the on the Hatch Act, um, I think the Hatch Act, uh, you know, conveys this norm generally. And you're right that it currently excludes uh, the president. The proposed amendment uh, that uh, Speaker Pelosi recently proposed uh, um, extends it to to the president. If I'm if I'm reading that correctly. Um, so that, that's, not, that's not law currently. So, um, and I wonder in, in terms of the deeper idea about whether that reflects some an, a sort of ambiguity about whether it, it should or could apply to the president, um, you know, uh, probably does in a sort of uh, mass, uh, Franklin versus mass kind of way. Um, uh, but I, I, I sort of still think that it's worth drawing pretty clean lines. Not everything's prohibited by the Hatch Act, but it, Pretty clean lines on 
you know, what's how you can use th th those government properties. So I guess I would be in favor, at least thinking about it now, of extending uh, the Hatch Act to include the president, that it wouldn't impede his ability to perform his duties, I don't think. But, uh, but, but, but thanks for raising it. I'll think about that some more. And on the First Amendment, yeah, I, I, I'll need to dig deeper on this kind of contradiction between the very thing that the, the contradiction you point out, uh, um, you know, that we, that if we're permissive of government speech in uh, some respects, uh, how do we line draw about when it's partisan and not? And I'll have to, I'll have to work more on that. So thanks for alerting me. And I look forward to, to talking more about that. Thank you. I should mention that one, you know, sort of pandemic silver lining of having this event online is that we have got some great attendees, not only from Pennsylvania, but from all over. So Michael Hertz, maybe I should ask people to introduce themselves. Um, Michael Hertz is a professor at Cardozo in New York City and is another amazing administrative law scholar. So thank you for joining us. Who else has questions? I see a raised hand from. Yes, looks like um, it says V Nielsen. Joy, if you uh, could. Yep. Uh, hi, I hope you can hear me if I had my phone. Um, yeah. yeah, so my question is, I mean, you were talking about some, some actions by the current president that sort of go beyond some of the norms that we've seen in, in prior presidencies. and. It seems to me like when, you know, if there were a new administration, that there would be a real tension between like trying to do sort of the same thing to gain back some of the over overreach of this president. But, you know, I think that there's sort of a, a desire to get back to the norms, but if we've been pushed so far in one direction and we, you know, the a Biden administration would sort of follow the normal rules, um, then how does one ever regain what's been lost? But if we don't follow the normal rules, then does it just keep getting more and more polarized like the, the chart that you showed us the, the picture of? Uh, yeah, and sorry, what's your first name? I don't know, Ms. Nils. Sorry, uh, hi, I'm Vicki Nielsen. I'm an immigration lawyer at a nonprofit. Um, uh, Vic Nielsen, nice to meet you. Um, thank you so much for your question. Yeah, I think there is, that, that seems like the, it, it, almost the tension our country is facing right now and, and, and at large, which is suppose uh, President Biden is elected. You know, is this a moment where we get, do we, are, we, are we about to come into our first or another sort of post Watergate moment where there's a wave of uh, appetite for institutional reform and sort of good government uh, prerogatives? I think that that's sort of what the bill that Nancy Pelosi announced was was trying to do. Saw some of these vulnerabilities, so I think that's that's a sort of norm-based uh, idea which has some pretty strong roots in the Democratic Party right now. Uh, and then there's the the natural you know uh, line of interest which says let's double down on on if they can do it, we can do it too. And you know, in some sense, conversations about court packing and other things are about you know, breaking norms and pushing that further. So I don't know, to me, I feel like these kinds of actions uh, are not liked by anyone. I don't think that uh, most, uh, uh, I think there's a pretty broad uh, section of the political spectrum that would embrace these kinds of reforms and see these as outliers and not to be repeated. So I think that that, that would recommend that there's at least as to some of the kinds of things I'm talking about, a little bit of a post Watergate moment that we might have, uh, depending on how things shake out. Now it could come out very differently. So, but I, but but I guess my my sense is that there's a pretty broad coalition around these kinds of ideas, and that that would that would you know maybe at, get, give some support for this sort of pulling back and norm reinforcing moment. I'm also a, you know that goes to my own inclinations too. But you know uh, so maybe I'm just projecting. But that, that's that, that, there's some thoughts on, on that. I'd be interested if you or others, uh, what, what thoughts are. 
Other questions or comments? Okay, looks like we have um, Jade B. Hello. Um, as you can hear, I'm actually not from the US. Um, so I, by far, am not as well versed in the legal sphere of. Um, <laughs> US um, politics and um, legislative matters, but nonetheless, I'm very interested in it because I'm studying it for politics at school. Um, and I loved your presentation. I just wanted to ask, what do you, from a UK perspective, what do you think would be needed for more stringent measures to be put in into US law in order to prevent um, partisan politics from becoming more um, prominent because I think when studying it in the UK we're taught that it's very dependent on circumstance and even though pork barrel politics um, and gerrymandering is very prominent it's very based upon the circumstances surrounding um, the presidency and how um, like divided congress can be so what would you say if more uh, measures were to be put in place, what would you say would be needed um, specifically to prevent um, these measures from being manipulated depending on the circumstances surrounding the president? Yeah, um, Jade, thank you so much for tuning in and uh, um, thanks. Um, you know, the, 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 I think gerrymandering is done at the state level. So that's always gonna be, that's, that's a longer term conversation about reform at the state level. There was litigation up to the Supreme Court recently uh, ended badly trying to challenge uh, partisan gerrymandering. That, that, that's, that looks like it's a dead letter for now. Um, as to the reforms of the use of government for partisan purposes, um, I think we would need a coalition of kind of, a kind of good government coalition to come in. I think strengthening the Hatch Act would be important. I think um, other kinds of uh, reforms, you know, we have a National Voter Registration Act, which ha has room for improvement. Uh, but I think it's a couple of specific uh, reforms along, along those lines um, that, that would, I think, help to constrain uh, management more, uh, more generally. Um, but that would require legislation in most cases. So we would need to have a Congress that can pass legislation, which we haven't had much of recently, and a Congress that has an appetite for, and a president that has an appetite for closing down and limiting presidential prerogatives. And we haven't had that recently, and in some sense, the story of presidentialism is the increased uh, expanse of powers in the executive branch statutorily granted. So we'd have to have an appetite for both of those. One thing I'll just maybe, uh, you may already know, there's an excellent book that does comparative work uh, by Peter Kane uh, called Controlling Administrative Power. I think I'm looking over my bookcases. I think that's right. And, it, and, and he really goes through a little bit. He, he doesn't, you know, the, the different definition of politics in the US and the UK. And, and in a way, I think you have a much more concentrated government. So some things that are difficult for our government to achieve, your government can achieve very easily. And that maybe in, in most circumstances builds in some constraints. So thank you for your question. There's a kind of initial set of responses. Thank you. Um, and we have a question next from Professor Bijal Shah, who uh, teaches at Arizona, Arizona State University. Hi, Kevin. Can you hear me? I can, Vijal. How, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well. It was a, This was a terrific presentation. Uh, thank you so much for this project and for introducing it to, to us, a broader audience. Um, you know, I really see, I'm, I, 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 um, I enjoyed, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. I, I really see it as sort of pushing back against the, the rise of unitary executive theory, right? And the way in which it's taken over sort of both doctrinal, um, uh, the doctrinal landscape as well as maybe the popular imagination. Um, and so I appreciate it for, uh, uh, for that reason. Um, however, if I were looking at it from the perspective of someone who is supportive of the idea of, you know, uh, growth and expansion and presidential power, you know, given that I'm sympathetic to the project, I understand and that you are sort of chipping away at the, 
margins of presidential power to try to distinguish between presidential administration um, and forms of presidential administration that are just so problematic or are, are so clearly um, 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 uh, yeah, so problematic that that even a unitary executive theorist would look at the would look at that particular set of examples and 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 sort of agree with you that that this is not a way in which expansive presidential power should be um, should be used. But really, what distinguishes that context from any other context in which the president? Uh, uh, uses power in order to pursue political goals that of course have you know either a, a direct or an indirect benefit of um, improving the likelihood that the president will will gain political power in other words I'm not sure that if I believe in presidential power if I believe in an extent expansive approach to presidential power that I'm convinced that this area is any different than any other area where I, I think it should proliferate yeah, uh, Bijal, thank you so much. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrific question, and thanks for, for tuning in today, too, as well. Uh, and I, I think that you're, just to jump right to your question, because our time is short, um, I think you're right, which is, if, we, if, you, if you like presidential power generally, then the idea of distinguishing, I, I, my talk requires that we can make some distinction between policy that you want to implement because you think it's your prerogative and you you know it's part of your platform even and and when does it tip over the balance to uh, to to something that's so partisan we can say it could only be justified as trying to, couldn't be justified on a policy ground basically it could only be justified as trying to uh have an electoral effect and i guess to me the um uh that maybe puts my core examples to machinery of elections and campaigning. So maybe in that sense, it's a smaller, it could, I would have to keep to those examples. Um, on the other hand, you know, the, the, the presidential pork, I kind of feel like if you've got a statistical analysis of controlling for everything, it's showing you something that, that seems untoward there. But, but, but I, I take your point and I'll have to think about it more. And, and, and as I work out this project, think about how I'm gonna be able to uh, distinguish and Count for and think about uh, exactly that objection. So thank you so much for, for raising it. Thank you. Um, Thomas, you have a question. Yes, um, uh, my name is Thomas Allen, retired lawyer from Harrisburg. And I wonder, um, you had mentioned um, judi judicial intervention as a remedy, as a check for um, some of these um, uh, actions by the president and others. Um, are there non judicial remedies that could be invoked? Um, you don't want to bring every instance to a court to, to make a judgment. And are there other means to, um, to, I guess, check presidential power? Yeah, that's a great, uh, 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 Thomas, thank you so much for the question. And that's a great, great question. And I really need to include that, which is, I think probably transparency is the greatest remedy right here because it allows uh, 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 politics to take place, general politics to take place upon disclosure. And a lot of these examples, many of these examples, not the census examples, but the other examples were produced by journalists, right? And so I think that um, building in transparency and disclosure mechanisms would be a really important mechanism for checking these and uh, whether that's in the spending context or um, it, in, in other contexts as well. So that's my first thought would be transparency measures. There could be some other uh, kind of internal review. Uh, inspector generals, you could imagine playing a role if you, and I think they currently do play a role in uh, calling out and if they had more uh, enforcement authority, I think inspector generals, uh, people used to live in total fear of them and maybe they do so a little less. So I think that seems like an important kind of prompt there too. So. And maybe also the ethics, you know, uh, uh, that you can be uh, ethics violations. So all three of those, maybe if there's ethics violations, possible inspector general report, you know, and transparency, that's the kind of sunlight we need because everything is right. Getting to court is, is slow and uh, it's not going to happen for every kind of action. So th thank you so much. It's a great point. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for raising it. And um, last but certainly not least, we'll give the last question um, to Jeff Lubbers, who is another administrative law dynamo who we're happy to 
have with us today, and he teaches at American Law School. Well, thanks, Jill, and thanks, Kevin, for a stimulating presentation. This is sort of a semi-partisan question. Um, most of your examples, or I think all of your examples, are from the current administration and President Nixon. Um, do you have any examples from Democratic presidents who have engaged in similar activities, and would that help you gain bipartisan support for some of the recommendations you're making? Yeah. Um, hi, Jeff. Great to see you, and thanks so much. Uh, thanks very much for the, and, and it's a great question. So um, I need to work on my Democratic examples. I definitely do. Um, the uh, examples of pork barrel spending, some of those, uh, uh, a couple of those studies go through uh, uh, at least the first term of uh, uh, President Obama, I believe. But I really need to work on more Democratic examples. I'm sure they're there. Uh, Democrats, you know, uh, I think engage in these kinds of things as well. And so I sort of want to uh, paint a story that there was, I, overall, I think that there were elements of this percolating. We may have seen it, seen it come out more in a more extreme form uh, recently, uh, at, you know, but I, I definitely, and, and to get, you know, bipartisan buy-in, I need to for sure uh, find those democratic examples. So I, that's, that's on my list to do. So th thanks, Jeff. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Stack, for sharing your thoughts with us and um, I'm sure you are, you're free to go, but if you have any remaining questions, I'm sure Professor Stack wouldn't mind hanging around for a few minutes if anyone has any questions that didn't get answered. Thank you so much for joining us and hopefully soon we will all be back together in person. Th thank you so much everyone for coming and for your questions. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity.